Saturday, October 3rd, 2020, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. I've been getting a lot of questions about, are you going to talk about JP Morgan, uh, the fine they paid for spoofing uh, gold and silver? Uh, yeah, and that's what I want to talk about today. I personally think spoofing is just the tip of the iceberg of the manipulation of the psychological uh, operation that uh, central banks, bullion banks, uh, mainstream media uh, carry out against gold. Uh, gold, uh, for me, the manipulation is much bigger than just spoofing. And before I start, I want to explain what spoofing is. I want to explain why spoofing has grown so much in the market, especially the futures market. And, and I can do that because I worked as a futures uh, and options broker for over 20 years in the city of London. When I started out as a futures broker in 1993, uh, all the trading was done on the floor of exchanges. In London, we had the London Financial Future Exchange, or LIFE. Uh, the floor of that exchange was huge. It was a huge exchange. And how it worked was that uh, on the floor of the exchange, you've got the pits. Each pit is uh, where you trade a different futures contract, right? And uh, in that pit, you have the traders. And uh, there's different kinds of traders. There are traders for the brokers and banks that have their booths around the pits. And what are those booths? Well, that's where other brokers are on the phone to clients or to uh, the broker's office. For example, I didn't work uh, on the floor. I worked up in the office my uh, first uh, employer in the futures market, uh, their office was actually above the exchange, the Life Exchange, uh, on Cannon Street in the city of London. So I used to call my colleagues, uh, let's say, in the uh, Bund booth. That's where they traded the, the German government bond future, uh, uh, the Bund booth. Uh, and uh, he would go to our trader in the pit and give him the order. So those traders in the pit, most of them were uh, basically trading for brokers, uh, for banks as well. Banks also had uh, a presence in the booths and, and they acted for their traders in the office and also for clients. And then you had what you call the local traders. These are independent people uh, who raise some cash, buy, buy a, a membership, in the exchange and then start trading with their money with the other traders, the bank traders, the brokers traders, right? And uh, spoofing was a normal occurrence uh, when there was uh, an exchange floor. Uh, so what is spoofing? Well, let's say a local wanted to drive the market lower because they had a short position or he or she had a short position. He would offer like 500 contracts like this very quickly and then uh, other people acting in that contract would see that let's say and go up to uh to the office and say wow someone's offering 500 here do you want to lower your offer and that's what it would do it, it would trigger uh the market lower or vice versa uh the only problem with spoofing for the person spoofing is that uh he could get caught out or she could get caught out if they were offering too much or bidding too much, someone might, might act upon it. And uh, this person might be caught with a position it didn't want. And also, all the other actors around see that and they might say, well, this guy is just uh, spoofing, right? So it has no impact. But uh, that, that's what spoofing was about. It wasn't really illegal. Uh, I would say I think they've made it illegal uh, since 2008. But what happened to the uh, uh, market, especially the futures market, is that uh, gradually all these markets uh, were moved to uh, screen trading systems. So and uh, I remember back in the day of the floor, you could know who was doing everything. 
You could call the COMEX floor and they would say, well, JP Morgan just sold a thousand uh, gold futures. JP Morgan is offering 2000, which is a big uh, order, right? So they're trying to drive the market uh, lower. So there was transparency. Everyone knew who was doing what. Have you ever wondered why they had all those really uh, fancy jackets that they wore different colors? It's because you knew who was doing what. Uh, you, oh, you could see Barclays, you could see locals usually had a red jacket, I think, uh, in London on the Life uh, Exchange. And, and those floor exchanges were all over the world. You had the, uh, the market in Paris called the Matif. That was on the floor of an exchange. I visited that exchange many years ago. I think it was in an old theater or uh, opera house. It was a really weird uh, floor. I did go to the Comex floor on, on NYMEX, uh, the Life Exchange floor. I used to go down there quite a bit to see uh, my colleagues, but I, I was a futures broker in the office because I was talking to clients uh, mainly like in Europe and they would call me and I would get uh, to a direct line, open line to let's say the BTP booth that BTP was the Italian government bond future. And I would ask uh, my colleague who worked for the same firm uh, and, and he would ask uh, our trader in the pit, where is the BTP? And they would do the hand signals like uh, two bit at three. That, all those hand signals were like uh, where the price was, the quantity. Uh, so that's how spoofing worked. Uh, and then gradually all these, as I said, by the end of the decade, uh, all the floors uh, of most exchanges had been closed. The life exchange went completely electronic. And uh, eventually also the CME, the COMEX, there's not really any uh, futures exchanges out there anymore who trade on the floor. Uh, maybe one or two, I'm not too sure, maybe the LME, but I think even that is gone electronic. And what happens in, the, in an electronic market is that uh, there is no transparency. It's just numbers and volumes under trading system. And uh, you can't tell whether it's JP Morgan or, or, or whether it's a broker uh, putting a bid and offer in. And it's very easy to, to pull or uh, remove that bid and offer. And you can put huge sizes there to scare the market off. So the spoofing on electronic markets is kind of different and uh, they've made it illegal. So the traders for JP Morgan, for example, that were spoofing gold and silver or even treasuries, uh, I heard, uh, they, they uh, in the old days, would have to call uh, their uh, broker on the floor or their broker in an office, that broker would call uh, the guy uh, in the booth or go, would go to the guy in the pit and see where the market was. So they couldn't really spoof. It took time. If they wanted to spoof, let's say, on the floor and they're calling from an office, they will, would probably get caught quite badly because it took a while to get the order uh, canceled. So, but uh, with the electronic trading, a lot of these traders, they've circumvented or they uh, completely avoid uh, the uh, brokers and they can trade themselves directly. So they put these uh, huge uh, offers or bids to move the market. And uh, you can bet these guys know where the stops are because they follow the technicals. Uh, for example, right now, uh, gold, is uh, trading around 1900. We know that if it breaks through 1920, uh, which is a really historical level, it was the all time high back in 2011, uh, which we broke earlier this year. Uh, and uh, you saw how the market really flew uh, higher after breaking that level, then we broke below that level. Now, if it breaks above uh, that level, we know that it will go a lot higher. So Let's say we get to uh, 1919. Uh, someone could come in and put a 191950 bid for 10,000 futures, right? Which is a huge uh, size. It's 100 ounces uh, per contract. And that could trigger stops. And that could get the market going higher and vice versa. So it is a manipulative uh, strategy, spoofing. 
Do I think it moves markets in ways that it shouldn't naturally? Yes, uh, but uh, it, it's made it even worse, the uh, electronic trading, the screen trading, the digital trading. Uh, because it was very difficult to do uh, the huge kind of spoofing that we see now in the markets. Uh, and uh, what, what I'm trying to say here, I'm not trying to say that uh, the bullion banks aren't manipulating gold. But what I think is even more important than just the spoofing is the uh, covert understanding by central banks that they have to control the gold price, that uh, they need to keep it... Uh, from rising too quickly and uh, I think that's the, the major manipulation and I'll give you an example that I found that I, I think I can prove from back in the 70s and it actually involves the uh, New York Fed and the Vatican Bank and uh, at the time uh, guess who was the president of the New York Fed well it was Paul Volcker and uh, I did a video about this and I'm going to put uh, a link to it in the description. I'm going to put it up in the cards. And I'm also going to put a link to a playlist I've done about gold manipulation. Uh, all the videos that I've done about it. I've talked a lot about it, uh, gold uh, price manipulation. Uh, so here we go. This is October 6, 1975. This is a letter from uh, the guy at the Vatican Bank, right, to Paul Volcker. Benedetto Argentari. So you can see here, uh, it's the administration of the patrimony of the ap the head of, of the Apostolic Church. So that's the Vatican Bank. So it's addressed to Paul Volcker, President Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Liberty Street. I found this letter online uh, when I did this video. Uh, this letter now, when you go online, it's blurred. You can't read it anymore. Uh, but I was lucky enough to have it in my old video. I, I did a screenshot, so I've saved this because I think they don't want people to see this, right? So it says, Dear Mr. Volker, I wish to tell you how much I appreciated your kind reception and the conversation we had in New York one month ago. Your letter of September 23rd has now come at hand. I note that you confirmed the opinion you expressed on the gold held by your bank on behalf of the Amministrazione, or the Vatican Bank. No, there is no objection to our selling it either on the official or the private market. You also tell me that you are studying the possibility of enlarging uh, the existing relations between your bank and the Amministrazione. I thank you very much for the attention you are giving to this matter. Hoping to see you again in the not too distant future. I remain sincerely yours, Benedetto Argentieri. So there you go. Um, Vatican Bank uh, and the New York Fed dealing in gold. Uh, and uh, I thought it was interesting that uh, the Vatican Bank would be okay with the New York Fed selling its gold. I, I think it could be uh, selling. It could also be leasing the gold from the Vatican Bank to sell it in the market. That's how it works. The central banks. That's why uh, the Bank of England still holds loads of gold uh, at the Bank of England. Not for the UK. We, we've only got 300 tons officially. But the Bank of England has 5,000 tons of gold in its vaults. And that's mostly for other central banks, institutions like the Vatican, the BIS, the IMF, right? And uh, they lease that gold out through the LBMA to the bullion banks. So what does that mean? Well, the bullion banks borrow that gold, they lease it for a while, and they sell it short in the market, right? And they leverage it as well. They might lease, let's say, a ton, but they will sell 10 tons worth of gold. And a lot of times the leasing is done at levels uh, that are very important for the gold uh, price, right? Uh, and uh, I had a look at where gold was at the time of this letter, right? He notes in the letter that they met a month before, right? In the beginning of September. So I've looked at the, the price of gold here uh, back in 1975. 
uh, beginning of September. It was trading around 160 here, as you can see. And uh, prior to that, I think gold had topped just below 200. Uh, that was uh, in the run-up to when gold was made legal again in the U.S., right? That was the all-time high, around 200. So when you read that letter, you find it weird that the Vatican Bank is all right with the Fed, New York Fed, selling its gold. I would be concerned if someone wanted to sell my gold, right? But uh, I think there's a lot more to that letter. Uh, there's a lot more to what they talked about. I, I would say that the Vatican Bank guy went to New York, uh, sat down with Paul Volcker, and Paul Volcker said, you know, we need to... Uh, try to uh, get the price of gold lower because of the inflationary pressure. Paul Volcker is known to, to have been an enemy of gold, right? I'll, I'll show you here what Paul Volcker ha has said in the past, right? There is something here from uh, the BIIWII blog, blog post, and it says, from the Cudlow show, Rick Santelli recalls Paul Volcker thusly. And this is a quote. Uh, from uh, Rick Santelli. I can't remember the exact quote, but when I used to trade and Mr. Volcker was Fed chairman, he said something like, gold is my enemy. I'm always watching what gold is doing, right? So I'm sure that's uh, what uh, Paul Volcker said to Mr. Argentieri of the Vatican Bank. He said, uh, we're going to be uh, driving the price lower. I'm not comfortable with the price here around 200. Uh, will you lease some of your gold so we can sell it in the market? Or uh, why don't you sell it? Because we know gold is going to go lower so you can make a profit in fiat dollars and buy it back. And in that, in, in that context, I understand why the Vatican Bank would want to uh, sell its gold. And look at where the gold price was when they met roughly personally, right? I think it's uh, interesting as well that the guy from the Vatican Bank goes to New York to meet with Paul Volcker. And why is that? Well, because doing this on the phone is not really a good idea, right? You want to keep it confidential, even though there's a letter there. I'm not sure how that letter got into the public uh, domain, but you can see that gold was at 160 around that time, and it traded all the way down to almost 100 by the end of August 1976. So I'm sure the Vatican Bank was very happy in selling its gold at 160 and buying it back probably around 100. Uh, and I think that's the big manipulation uh, amongst uh, central banks, amongst international institutions like the BIS. And uh, that's why they keep a lot of gold still to control the price. And the other way I think uh, they uh, manipulate the, the perception, not just the price of gold, but the perception that gold is just a commodity, right, is the way they raid the market. Uh, is the way they uh, actually had to create a futures contract when gold became legal in the US. Uh, I think it was January 1st, 1975. The gold future contract on COMEX started trading on December 31st or December 30th, 1974, right? Because I think the powers that be want to make gold seem like just another commodity, very volatile, to keep people discouraged from uh, acquiring real physical gold. And I think GLD is another uh, step towards that as well, because y you can't really buy one GLD and ask for a redemption in gold. Uh, I, I think that the minimum is in the millions. Uh, and even then, I think a lot of wealthy people would probably have a difficult time getting the physical gold from GLD. That's why I think people like Kyle Bass a few years ago, uh, they advised, uh, like I think it was the Un University of Texas, uh, to uh, actually demand delivery from COMEX to hold real physical gold, right? Because they know that uh, the COMEX, the LBMA, these institutions, uh, they leverage gold, they try to keep gold very volatile, uh, and uh, to keep the public uh, 
out of the gold markets. The central banks, uh, the governments, they don't want the public uh, protecting themselves with real physical gold. And, and that's, I think, the, the big manipulation. That's the big manipulation. And uh, I think it's good that uh, they've punished people uh, that are uh, abusing uh, the gold market through this electronic spoofing, like JP Morgan. They also uh, fined a few years ago the FCA. Uh, I think it was six years ago. They fined Barclays uh, Bank, 26 million, for also manipulating uh, the gold market to try to uh, make a profit on options trades. They fined them 26 million pounds, right? But uh, these banks, uh, they uh, earn so much revenue that these fines are just, for me, I think they consider it just the cost of doing business. I don't think it's going to discourage them. If not through spoofing, they're going to find another way to manipulate the market. Uh, I would say that uh, it's going to be very hard to uh, really get down to the bottom of the manipulation because they're very powerful institutions that are, that are doing it. As you saw, the Vatican Bank and the New York Fed were doing it already back in the 70s. And you can bet they're still doing it now. Uh, but uh, they're secretive organizations like the BIS, right? Uh, so uh, does this mean that uh, you shouldn't get any gold uh, because it's manipulated? Uh, no, I think it's uh, the complete opposite. I can understand why people get discouraged uh, when they see the, the moves in gold and silver that sometimes don't make any sense. I started noticing the manipulation, uh, the daily manipulation of the gold price back in 2002 when I first bought my uh, uh, gold coins. And, and I was working as a futures and options broker. Uh, I didn't trade gold futures for my clients. I was in the bond markets, but I was falling after I bought my first gold coins. I was falling the gold market every day because I had an interest in it. And I quickly realized uh, that it wasn't a random market. Uh, and, and what do I mean by that? Well, every time the official trading on COMEX st started, which was uh, 8.20 a.m. New York or 1.20 p.m. London, and why official trading? And that was the open of the regular hours, right? Because gold trades almost 24-7, uh, the futures market uh, trade uh, on what, what they used to call Globex. Uh, I'm not sure what they call it now. But there is always like a, an official uh, regular hour open. That's a vestige uh, of when uh, the gold market didn't trade 24 seven, right? The gold market opens in New York at 8.20 a.m. I, I soon realized watching the gold market that uh, right around one o'clock London till 1.20, let's say gold was up $10, we would see gold trade right back down uh, and then even accelerate even more after the uh, futures open in New York. And uh, you would find these patterns around these set times. Another one was uh, 10, uh, 1030 a.m. London, right uh, around the time of the a.m. fixing. Uh, there used to be a lot of shenanigans. You could see the price move around. And then also in the p.m. fixing, which is around 3 p.m., uh, you can see the same kind of stuff. A lot of times after the p.m. fixing, you would see the futures on COMEX trade lower because the physical market wasn't around anymore. So I noticed all these things. I started looking into it and uh, I found GATA, a gold antitrust action committee run by Bill Murphy and uh, Mr. Powell as well. Uh, and uh, I've been following them since then. And I've done interviews with uh, Bill Murphy about the gold manipulation and Bill Murphy knows that it's uh, much bigger than just spoofing. Uh, I highly recommend you go to his website, gata.org. Uh, and as I said, I've done a, a playlist of my videos on gold manipulation. And I, I have an interview with Bill Murphy there you can, uh, you can listen to. And uh, also there's a lot of information on his website about the manipulation. So... 
as I said, I used to get very uh, fed up with the manipulation, very discouraged. And I still sometimes look at it and, and, and you know, and uh, it does like uh, annoy me a little bit, but I've tried to uh, let it not annoy me. And I know it's difficult. Uh, so it's been years and years of immunity that, that I've uh, grown to this manipulation. And I would say that uh, in the end, they won't succeed. Because if you look at the uh, gold price going back to uh, the uh, late 60s, uh, I mean, the trend is higher. As Voltaire once said, paper money uh, always trades uh, to its intrinsic value uh, eventually, and that is zero. And that's what we're seeing. They've had a lot of firepower. They've manipulated it a lot. But that's the reason why they've been able to keep the fiat currency system going. So what's the uh, best solution to end this manipulation? Uh, basically, as an individual, I think the uh, best thing to do is to keep stacking physical gold and silver. And uh, why physical? Well, because it will drain away uh the physical market, it will make it harder and harder for these bullion banks, for these central banks, for the Vatican banks of the world, for the BISs of the world to really be able to control the price as much as they do. Uh, because if they keep uh, manipulating the price lower, if they keep it suppressed for too long, uh, people will get even more of the physical and they'll be cleaned out eventually. And that's why they they uh, would be stupid to try to keep it too low because people would realize that it's a bargain and it would clean them out. The estimate is that there's about 200,000 metric tons of gold above ground that's ever been mined. The central bankers and official institutions hold about 30,000 tons. So only 15% of the market. So it wouldn't take uh, much to clean them out. And that's what they're scared about, you see. That's why I wouldn't worry about the manipulation, uh, unless, of course, you buy physical gold to trade, which I, I wouldn't recommend. Uh, I think physical gold is like holding savings, like saving money, gold and silver, because they are money. You do it to protect yourself for a rainy day. So there you go. That's uh, my two cents on on the manipulation, on the JP Morgan story, on the Barclays story. I think these people are going to continue to manipulate or try to uh, suppress, try to discourage uh, the average person from getting into the gold market or silver market. Have you ever noticed when you talk to a friend or someone and uh, you start talking about markets and you tell them, oh, I've, I'm buying uh, gold and I, I get a lot of people saying, oh, but gold is very risky, right? So they've done a good job in this psychological operation. Yes, I, I think spoofing is wrong, uh, what, what they do in the markets. And uh, the electronic trading has helped it. But I wouldn't say it's the most important part of the manipulation of the gold market. It's just like the tip of the iceberg, as I said. It's a much bigger racket, I would say. Uh, and uh, why why are central banks and bullion banks so desperate to keep uh, the gold market manipulated or keep people away from it? Well, because they know that uh, if the public uh, gets involved in gold, if the public learns about the scam that the fiat currency system is, they will rapidly lose control of everything. Uh, their currencies will collapse, their central banks will be no more, right? So I actually think we're much more powerful than the central banks. We just need to uh, keep uh, stacking physical gold and silver, and uh, they hate that. And that's why uh, people like the Gold Council who are allied or very close to the central banks keep pushing uh, GLDs, ETFs. You should try to avoid ETFs at all costs, you, you should try to get the physical. And that's how we're gonna defeat them. Their Achilles heel is physical, right? They hate uh, the, the small people getting physical. 
And that's why they, they keep pushing these ETFs. So uh, there you go. Um, if you enjoyed this video, uh, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. I wish you all a great uh, weekend. Take care. Bye.